Reverend Richie Dean, she uh, spoke with us last year. Also, um, she gave a presentation this past summer at either the Cash or Peace Village. I don't remember which one it Peace was. Village. It all blends together for me. Um, <laughs> but let's welcome her back. And she's local, so she's one of our local presenters. And it's lovely to have her here at Exploring Psychedelics once again. OK. Hi, everybody. Egypt, mysterious, ancient, exotic, land of legends, myths, fables, famous for its buried treasures, mummies, and of course, aliens. Well, what if I was to tell you the most mysterious uh, artifact of ancient Egypt was not the art of the uh, pyramids and the buildings and the culture. But this one plant, I'm going to take this uh, walk around. Thank you. So this one plant is really the most mysterious thing that Egypt has to offer. And I'm going to show you why. <coughs> Currently, the uh, Nymphia Corellia is a rare and endangered flower. Uh, it no longer grows in, uh, on the Nile. It's cultivated only in greenhouses and a few rare locations. Um, um, it is almost extinct because of the pollution of the Nile and uh, because the Nile no longer floods. When they built the dam, um, now you just have this steady state and so you no longer get this wonderful rich silt that the Nile was famous for. And so because this is uh, a rice paddy type of flower that grows in only a few feet of water, um, now that silt is all contaminated with, uh, with fertilizers and phosphates, and so it's no longer growing. It was deeply spiritual to the Egyptians. You will find these kind of, of reliefs, paintings, drawings all over Egypt. Every tomb, every temple, all have this kind of representation of holding the flower up to the nose. Initially, this was taken to be um, uh, a scent, that this was a perfume coming in. But I can tell you of having worked with this flower, it has very little scent. The idea that it was a perfume is a myth. So what is so special about this flower? So here you've got all of this recorded history of all of these images showing this silly flower, as it were, being the core of Egyptian spirituality. In fact, the Egyptians went so far as to dedicate a god to the single flower. It is the only time in the history of humanity that a god became or dedicated to a sacred flower. Again, indicating that there was something extraordinarily special about this flower. As late as the end of the Egyptian world, in about 700 BC, there was a cult of Nefertem, and all throughout the Mediterranean, you find these little fetishes and these little statues that people were carrying around all over the southern Mediterranean. Uh, these little statues have turned up bronze, gold, um, and, and various different stones that were carved. So there was something very important going on. I might add that Nefertem was the son of Sekhmet and Ptah. And at the early stages of the Egyptian world, roughly around 3000 BC, those three gods were the main deities of the Egyptian pantheon. Of course, there were about 42 major gods in Egypt, but many, many more. Tutankhamun, when uh, Howard Carter uh, uh, broke into the tomb in 1922, um, his tomb was filled with Egyptian uh, blue lotus uh, relics. In fact, uh, King Tut himself was shown uh, there on the right, uh, his head coming out of the blue lotus, as if 
he was being represented as Nefertem. Uh, when the, the sarcophagus was opened, uh, Tutankhamun was found covered in blue lotus flowers, and in his mummy had this uh, collar of blue lotus surrounding him. So we see these representations of them holding the blue lotus up to their nose, up to their face. Initially, the, uh, the archaeologists of the Victorian age, the 1800s, simply just blew this off and said, oh, nice smelling flower, wasn't it? Um, however, the Egyptians work in symbology. Everything is symbolic, from the hieroglyphics to the, to the pictographs of, on uh, the tombs and, and, and temples. Um, there's something other going on here than just the flower being scented. My point is that here is a blessing of the pharaoh by goddess Sekhmet, and she is granting him everlasting life by the sacred Ankh. And in so, she touches the Ankh to his lips. This is reference to the opening of the mouth ceremony that's done in, during the embalming. But my point about this is that he is receiving the blessing from the goddess. And so therefore, it is in his face. My point is that it's the same by the flower being presented in front of the face. They are receiving the blessing of the flower. The first to publish on this was William M. Bowden uh, from Cal State Northridge in 1977. He went way out on a limb during the drug wars and published uh, several works on entheogens, and at the time he was calling them the narcotic flower, uh, narcotic uh, substances. And he was the first one to publish a paper on the possibilities that Blue Lotus was actually narcotic or an entheogen. Well, during the drug wars, of course, a lot of this just got swept under the, under the carpet. Nobody really wanted to pay much attention to it. Those people who did try it were going, well, we'll just take some blue lotus here and we'll crumble it and dry it and smoke it. And gosh, that didn't do anything. And then they said, well, maybe it's alcohol soluble. We'll throw it in wine. And gosh, that didn't do anything. So nothing really happened. It was just like it was this curiosity that nobody could still decipher, and nobody really could understand. So here's another interesting thing about Egypt and these, these pictographs and carvings on the stone walls. The blue lotus is frequently shown draped over jars. Symbolically, what's in the jar is that, that the, if I was going to try to tell you what was in the jar, this would be a good way of doing it. That maybe the blue lotus was actually in the jar. In 1998, a documentary was done by the BBC um, talking about the possibility of the blue lotus being an antheogen. And they did a 15-minute episode, very loose type of of, of uh, test where they um, uh, soaked some blue lotus flowers and uh, soaked them for a couple days and then gave them to a couple people and to see what the reaction was. And they filmed it. Um, uh, again, not clinical. Um, could have been uh, just biased by you know that the television cameras were running. Um, and so the people had, well, there was some mild effect and it was interesting. And again, that was about it. But it did present some curiosity to people, and people began to experiment you know, basically within this last uh, 15, uh, 20 years with the possibility that there was something to this. And about this time, my mentor, uh, a spiritual teacher, began to experiment with the sacred blue lily, the, the blue lotus, and uh, began to use it in a ceremonial uh, manner. Uh, specifically in conjunction with cannabis uh, or other substances to be able to potentiate the experience, to be able to say, okay, well, maybe blue lotus isn't the entire thing, but maybe it's a part of it. 
About that time, that's when I got involved. My spiritual awakening occurred um, about 2002, 2003, began my spiritual path. Um, uh, I really was a novice uh, at uh, the psychedelic world, but that was the piece that brought me to uh, uh, a spiritual awakening. It was the entheogenics that, that truly popped me open and said, wow, there's something else going out here into the world. What's that voice in my head? Who's talking to me? That type of thing. Um, so I spent the next 15 years um, in shamanic uh, teachings um, with various different teachers, uh, a shamanic school, um, uh, ordained through them in 2010. Um, so this has been my spiritual path of through the entheogenic world. And, so in 2010, after I was ordained, I had the opportunity to go on a spiritual pilgrimage to Egypt with a group of people who specifically created such a tour for people who felt that pull to Egypt, that that was their spiritual home, perhaps reincarnated from Egypt. Um, and so this was my opportunity to go there and to touch these monuments and to see this for myself. And during this time, we had private access to the temples. We had ceremonies every morning, pre-dawn, before the tourists would get there. We had just an extraordinary opportunity. And one location in particular was at, um, at Edfu. This is the temple of Horus, or Horu. Um, and that box that everybody's looking at uh, is the sanctuary of the god where the golden statue of Horus would be kept um, and only the high priestess and priest would able, be able to get into this room. But more importantly was, here we're standing there and it's dark, we have the candles lit and we're in ceremony and uh, somebody says, uh, turn around. This was behind me. This panel is about six feet wide. And it clearly shows blue lotus hanging over those jars in an offering tables. This is blue lotus in the jars, that it has been fermented in those jars. And the other thing that's really interesting is that there's different shapes to those jars, which begs the issue is that in all probability, different priesthoods, different people created different flavors of, of this sacrament indicating that there were slight differences. You know, that this wasn't just a, oh, we're going to make it this way like beer. But something is going on here to show that there is a specific reason the Egyptians specifically showed different types of jars. So I was initiated in the Temple of Isis. I'm just a tremendous uh, opportunity um, to, to serve the goddess and, um, and it really catapulted uh, me onto this journey. Uh, also initiated in the Great Pyramid, uh, you don't need entheogens in there when you lay inside that sarcophagus. That is an altered state experience all by itself. Um, I, took, I started working on a book on the Blue Lotus, and I wanted to find out whether or not the Blue Lotus had reached Greece and Rome. I had a suspicion it had, but there was no archaeological evidence published. But I knew there had to be something out there. So I spent three months uh, in Greece, and oh, I found her all right. I was hoping to be able to find just a scrap of evidence, just the slightest little tidbit. I walk into the museum, and this uh, is a funerary statue of a priestess, and she has uh, a blue lotus crown, open and closed, alternating blue lotus, and she's reverently holding this blue lotus closed bud. Now, mind you, she's Greek. This is in Athens. Now, mind you, this is at a time when, if you're going to ship these flowers across the Mediterranean, they're worth the weight in gold, you know, they're rowing for two weeks to get across to, 
But in 540 BC, here she is holding this blue lotus. Now, if you, when I showed you that slide of, the, of, of those little Nefertim statues, and I said that there was the Nefertim cult, my strong suspicion is that she was initiated in that Nefertim cult, and she had gone to Egypt. She'd either gone to Egypt or she'd gone to Libya to, uh, to the Greek colony of Kyrene. And, but she was initiated in the Blue Lotus. I spent a week in Delphi, and uh, um, clearly there's Blue Lotus air as well, those alternating Blue Lotus all the way to Delphi. So I spent uh, two months on Crete, specifically looking for information about this goddess and this cult. This is a, the Roman goddess Isis. We call her Isis, but the proper pronunciation is Isis. What's in the jar? That's not a water jar. That's not holy water. Again, archaeologists want to just blow it over and say it's water. It's not. It's, it's the jar is specifically called an onokoi. An onokoi was specifically um, made for wine. This is sacramental wine. So, because she's from Alexandria, because she has a blue lotus on her head, that's blue lotus in there. So, I made it all the way to Thailand to the farm for uh, seeing where these blue lotus flowers were grown. Uh, this is all since dried up. Um, thanks to global warming, but they lost the entire farm, and blue lotus is no longer being commercially grown. But I did have an opportunity to bring back 10 kilograms uh, of blue lotus, and we recreated blue lotus sacrament. Now, I'm going to jump ahead because I'm running out of time. Uh, this is from the temple of Seti the First in Abydos. There's four ingredients here. Blue lotus, mandrake, mushrooms, and poppies. There again, on the top up there, you see uh, mushrooms on the right-hand side. This, uh, interesting, we see priestesses with these type of hats. And they have eyes. It's been speculated that these are not hats. Again, symbology is everything, that they're actually mushrooms. You can see the representation there. OK, I'm going to spend five minutes real quick here. Current research, the last six months, a group of international uh, researchers, um, one of them, uh, have been experimenting with blue lotus and psilocybin. Fascinating results. As you know, psilocybin is almost exactly uh, the same as serotonin. All right. Psilocybin operates on one neuroreceptor. The 5-HT2A neuroreceptor is the one that, that psilocybin goes after. LSD does, DMT. They all go after this one neuroreceptor and uh, so there's a lot of research being done. All of this is cutting edge stuff, most of it in just the last six years. The ancients knew something that we're just now beginning to discover. So check this out. The two main ingredients of blue lotus is a porphine and nucephrine. A porphine works on serotonin, and this particular neuroreceptor, the same one that psilocybin does. The nucephrine works on the dopamine receptors. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm just going to talk about this one in particular. A porphine does a very interesting thing to DNA. The DNA of the receptor gets altered by the porphine, and it links in to uh, the DNA by slipping into the gaps in between uh, the empty space of the DNA. So um, this is the complicated uh, biochemistry of it. I'll just say that the center picture there is that the uh, a porphine is sliding in and in calculating the DNA, and the psilocybin binds 
on the edge. They bind in two different locations. So the interesting thing is that when you put these two together, you get a very interesting and different effect. Is that that the aporphine is modulating your your psilocybin effect. And what we've seen is some very unique similarities in the experience. Unlike most of our experiences, when we have a, a, a psilocybin experience, we can say, yeah, I'm seeing geometry, and, and I may or may not have a spiritual awakening a, or some kind of mystical experience. And there's, it's a lot of randomness. We're seeing some very specific similarities. So the first thing is that it's a very emotional experience. And there's releasable traumas. Um, uh, frequently, the subjects are crying for uh, at, at least an hour and then not remembering crying. Uh, there is a, is a unique sensation of change of perspective. Your, your perceptions of who you are change. And it's a lasting effect is that all of the subjects have all stated that, that months later that their life has changed from one sitting with this medicine. Um, there is a, uh, a, a profound, many of the people said that they had a profound uh, experience of a form of initiation. And that word kept coming up for us. It's like they all felt that they had experienced an initiation of some type. Not surprisingly, this medicine was used for initiatory rites in Egypt. They only got one, so there wasn't a party drug. It was a one-shot, uh, you know, you got initiated, and this was your life change. So that energy is in this plant, is actually in the plant. So I'm going to conclude here, and I know this was short. Uh, I know you should probably have questions if you'd like to grab me out there in the foyer. Uh, I'd be glad to answer questions. This is cutting edge research. I'm anxious if anybody wants to contact me, uh, especially uh, the people who are interested in publishing uh, 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 scientific work. I think that what we have here is something really, really interesting and cutting edge. That these two chemicals working on the same neuroreceptors and altering them in a very unique way, receiving uh, similar information from the test results, from the from, uh, test subjects, is very, very interesting and worth more research. Thank you very much.